Hi, we at Video Professor understand how hard it can be to learn to operate a computer. In the next few minutes, you will see just how easy we make it. You know, nothing will teach you as fast as our videos. So in no time, you will be on your way to achieving your goal, knowing how to operate your computer. By having this video, you can refer to it and learn from it at any time. Now listen to what some people just like you found by using our videos. You know, they really work. So enjoy this easy computer learning, and thanks. If you're ever trying to learn a computer system through a manual or on your own, have you ever sat there and said, God, I wish somebody who just knew how to do this would just sit down and show me. I hate trying to learn it on my own. And that's exactly what these tapes do. They sit there, they're a tutor right next to you, and they show you just how to do it. I was kind of amazed. Uh, I started out with the first one, and gosh, didn't have it on, but maybe 15 minutes and I knew more it seemed like in that short of time than I did reading 50 pages in a book. People have libraries of books today people have libraries of tapes and Video Professor would be an integral part of a personal or a professional tape library. As a teacher I really appreciate the step-by-step -step organization of the tapes. They allow each person to work at their own pace in their own time and to review as necessary. You can go back and review whatever you want and you don't have to have a teacher there saying, don't you remember, I told you. Welcome to the Video Professor series of computer learning tapes, the nation's number one computer trainer. We'll take you step by step through learning to use your computer software. On the screen now are some other tapes available in our series. When using these tapes, we suggest you watch them in their entirety. Then go back with your computer and practice each step. In keeping with the video professor's dedication to giving you the best lesson possible, we have packed these tapes with information and sometimes move at a pace that is faster than you will be able to follow along with as you are working with your computer. Remember, you can always pause or rewind the tape to learn each part. Now let's get started. The Internet. The information highway, the new electronic frontier, the world wide web. These phrases and concepts have become a part of everyday language, yet many of us still don't really know what these terms mean. In this lesson, we will not only introduce you to the basic concepts of these high tech buzzwords, but by following along with our easy to understand instructions, we'll have you on the internet, actually driving on the information highway and experiencing for yourself what these advances in communications and computer technologies hold in store for you. In this lesson, we will cover the system requirements needed to get you on the Internet, how to set up a connection with a service provider, what service providers are and what they offer. We'll see how to use electronic mail transfer or email, and how to browse the World Wide Web, where you will discover many places you can go finding interesting subjects. Before going further, I'd like to introduce my assistant, Suzanne. Viewers, normally I set up our lessons so you can follow along step by step as I guide Suzanne through the program. We will still do that, but the program we will be using, America Online, may not be on everyone's computer. PC Magazine ranks AOL as their editor's choice for providers, saying AOL's easy to use graphical interface, wide choice of content, and full easy internet access has proven enticing to both professionals and hobbyists. It is because of this and the fact that America Online is the largest service provider that we chose to use them to demonstrate this lesson. We'll also be using Windows 95. If you don't have Windows 95 on your computer or prefer using another provider service, you will still be able to understand how these programs work and follow along. All Internet providers work pretty much the same, and once on the Internet, all the basic information is the same. So after you see how the features of these programs work, you'll be ready to cruise the Internet no matter what program you use. I'll go into more detail about this later. I'm going to assume that each of you are familiar with the basics of computer operation and working within the Windows 95 environment. If you are new to Windows, you may want to see my tapes on learning Windows and Windows 95 first. Professor, what exactly is the Internet? Suzanne, that's a perfect place to start. What exactly is the Internet? Best defined, the Internet is a system of interconnected computers. Some of these computers are single, standalone units. Some are entire networks comprised of multiple computers, like you might find on a college campus. But what makes up the Internet is that these computers are linked together by communication paths and are all in agreement to use the same communication language. 
The Internet is estimated to connect some hundreds of thousands of computers and computer networks and link together 30 to 40 million individual users. If you think that these numbers sound imprecise, it's because the Internet is growing so fast and is so loosely organized that no one really knows exactly how many computers or users there really are. What's most important about this huge network is what it does. When our computer terminals are connected to the Internet, we can view information that resides in our own cities or in another state or in another country halfway around the world. The Internet is not owned or controlled by anyone. In fact, it was designed by the government in the Cold War era to keep communication paths open in case of a nuclear attack. With so many paths open, like an international telephone system, the information could flow freely even if many locations were destroyed. The beauty of the Internet is that we don't have to know about how it works. We can just accept the fact that it does work smoothly, easily, and seamlessly on a worldwide basis. Suzanne, let's start by listing the things we need in order to gain access to the Internet. The computer is the first item on the list. Your computer must have a modem that is connected to a telephone line. You'll also need data communication software and a provider to gain access to the Internet. For those of you who may not have these items yet, or may be looking to upgrade your computer, let's take a quick look at the, what they are and how they work. The first item on our list is a computer. I should mention here that there are Internet access tools for DOS-only PCs, Macintoshes, OS2s, and just about every other type of operating system in use today. We will be referring to Windows-based PCs in this lesson. Your computer should have a 386, 486, or a Pentium microprocessor. You will need at least 4 megabytes of random access memory, better known as RAM. 8 megs of RAM is better, and 16 megs is better yet for some of the larger graphic programs you'll find. Your hard drive will need at least 3 to 5 megabytes of free space, but it is recommended to have at least 15 megabytes available for AOL's new 3.0 version to run smoothly. Some programs, like Microsoft Network, recommend as much as 30 megs of free hard disk space. You will also need a mouse, a keyboard, and a monitor with VGA or higher capabilities. The system needs to be running DOS 3.1 or higher and Windows 3.1 or higher. A printer and a Windows-compatible sound card are optional but very useful. A modem allows the computer to translate its data into a signal that can travel over a standard telephone line to talk to another computer. You will need a Hayes-compatible modem that runs at least 9600 bits per second or a 9600 baud modem. The modem can be internal or external. The type of modem as well as the modem speed are considerations that you should talk to your computer dealer about. The faster the modem is able to transfer data, the faster the Internet information will appear. Again, this also depends on the amount of RAM you have. It's recommended to have at least a 14.4 baud modem. A 28.8 baud is twice as fast and a good thing to have when exploring some of the graphic-oriented programs you find on the Internet. There are even faster modems being sold now, so check with your dealer. Remember, speed is time on the computer. The faster you can get information, the less time you'll spend waiting for it, and the less connect time you'll pay for. Our next item is a telephone line. This will give us the communication path into an Internet access point. Suzanne is using a standard analog telephone voice line. If you happen to have any telephone extensions in the house, make sure nobody picks up another receiver while our computer is using it, or your connection will be seriously disrupted. Communication software is the next requirement. This software activates the modem and it's often supplied along with it. The Windows program has its own communication program and some Internet service providers have their own communication software. Which brings us to providers. There are several ways to access the Internet and the easiest is to use one of the most popular providers such as AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe, or Microsoft Network. These programs are geared to provide very user-friendly point-and-click systems for you to access the Internet as well as many other areas of interest in that particular program. You may want to do some research into what they have to offer to suit your needs. Each of these providers have their own format, which includes many services and activities, as well as access to the Internet. Later in this lesson, I will show you information as to cost and the various services of these providers, plus their phone numbers, so you can decide which is best for you. But for now, let me explain a little bit about what these providers offer. We'll go into more detail with some of these areas when we get online. Each of these providers allow you to have an email address all your own so you can write and receive mail on your computer. They have bulletin boards where you can post and read notes on a variety of subjects. They have chat groups on many subjects that allow you to actively communicate with others who may or may not share your view. They have programs to limit Internet access to your children. They have their own shopping areas. 
They have information on the latest and most interesting news stories. They have interviews and discussion groups with celebrities and people in the know, dealing with every subject you can think of, and programs to help you gain access to the Internet and World Wide Web. Although these providers offer the same kind of features, they are exclusive to each provider. Like a city that has two newspapers where the section headings are the same but the content is different. These providers offer the same kind of features but differ as to their content, meaning AOL's chat group will not be the same as Prodigy's. Where they are similar is when you leave their site and enter the world of the Internet, which again is accessible through all of these providers. Some other providers offer plain vanilla access directly to the Internet. These providers don't offer many other programs or services other than access to the Internet. They also offer little or no instruction on how to use the Internet resources. We'll also look at some of these services later in this lesson. There are other ways to get to the Internet using free net programs, but we won't be looking at them in this lesson. Again, we are going to use AOL as our provider. Look at some of the features of that program and then explore the World Wide Web. Remember, if you have or want another provider, they all work pretty much the same and offer the same kinds of programs, so you can still learn what these programs do and how they work just by observing our journey into cyberspace. After deciding on your provider, the first thing you need to do is establish an account with them so you can use their services. Establishing an account is a cookie cutter approach of fill in the blanks and is the same procedure for all providers. We'll run through this quickly. If your modem uses another program, for instance, a fax program, you should exit that application before starting this setup process. If you have a floppy disk of the provider you want, simply put it in your floppy drive, select Run from the Start menu, and type in the Installation command. This is usually a setup command located right on the disk. The installation process will begin. To register, you'll be asked for all your personal information like name and address. You'll be asked to enter the phone numbers that best fit your location for the number to call in to the provider. This is a choose from the list type of option. You may need to provide what type of modem you have, how fast it is, and what COM port it is connected to, so be prepared with that information. Finally, you'll be asked to give a credit card number to pay for your account and be asked to enter your screen name and or password, which is usually supplied with the software. Most providers allow you to change this to something more suitable to your liking after signing on. After all that's done, you can sign on to the service and start your journey into cyberspace. Well, here we are. We've successfully made the connection with AOL. Understand we're not quite on the Internet yet. This is the provider's program that also has lots of places to go and things to do. Let's take a quick tour of some of these features. Viewers, remember if you have another provider, they probably have the same sort of features in their program and clearly marked as to how to access them. If you've just installed your program, you may have some automatic updates loaded onto your computer when the welcome screen appears, or at other times during an online session. This process keeps your software up to date with the latest upgrades. Also, the opening screens are always being changed with new things. Since this is constantly happening with online services, your screen will look different from Suzanne's. We're looking at the AOL's welcome screen right now. Viewers, don't worry if your screen looks a little different than ours. It changes quite often to display up-to-date topics. These topics can be accessed by clicking on their icons. This screen also lets you know if you have received any mail. Suzanne, click on the button marked Channels. Now we have a screen displaying all the general topic areas you have access to. This screen, as well as most of the screens you'll see, has all the familiar Windows features. Click once on the File menu item and then press your right arrow a few times and you see many of the commands available to you. Now Suzanne, click anywhere outside the drop down menu and slowly move your pointer across the icons on the menu bar and notice you'll get a message about what these icons do. As with any Windows program, you have several ways to accomplish the same task. Probably the easiest way to access different locations is through using the topic buttons on the main menu screen. As you can see, there are several places to visit right here in America Online. Let's quickly see how to navigate through this system. Suzanne, click on Personal Finance. This leads us to a screen with more choices. Let's choose Stocks and Investing by double-clicking on those words. 
Now we have more choices. On the right are several choices for reading what some stock analysts have to say about the market. Click the Quotes and Portfolios. Now we are given a screen where we can actually find what stocks are trading for and create a portfolio for your investments. Type in IBM, the stock symbol for IBM, in the quote box. Click on the Quotes button and we get what shares of IBM are selling for at this time whether it's up or down, and a history of its highs and lows. We are not actually on the Internet here, but choosing subjects that take you deeper into more specific areas is similar to what we will experience once we get on the Internet. Click on this Windows Close button to move back one level, and keep closing windows until we are back to the Channels window. Again, viewers, other providers offer similar topics that come with their program. All these topics are easy to access. And I'm sure you'll want to come back and explore them on your own. But for now, let's move on to sending and receiving email. Email stands for electronic mail and is a way for you to send letters as well as computer files to other computers that are hooked up to the Internet and or a provider service. Click the Welcome button on the bottom of the screen. And we now see our icon for mail. If you have new mail, this button would say, you have mail. We don't seem to have any, but click on this icon anyway to open AOL's mail messaging system. Viewers, you may get a download here if you've just set up a new account. On the upper right of this screen, you have several menu choices. These choices will change often for current affairs. Under other things you can do are several choices you can check out by double-clicking on these words. Click on online newsletters. Now click on About Online Newsletters. Here you can read what these services are all about. Close these windows back to our mail screen. Click on Message Exchange. And on the next screen, click on List Categories. Now we are given three categories to check out. Click on List Topics. Notice on top of this window we are given topics with 3,368 documents created. Let's read all of them. Just kidding. But I did want to point out there is a lot of information for you to read about email if you want it. Click on Unwanted Mail and you get many ways to read and reply to email problems you might encounter. This is an area you may want to come back and check out so you don't fall into pitfalls many others have experienced. One note here, be careful who you send your email address to, as you could start getting junk mail just like you do through your regular mail. Okay, close all of these windows back to our Mail Center screen. Suzanne, click on the Mail pull-down menu. Here are more choices for things to do with your email. From this list, you can open the Mail Center, check new mail, or read mail you've already read or already sent. Suzanne, click on the Edit Address Book option. We'll check out some of the other options in a minute. Since we haven't entered any addresses in our address book yet, this box is empty. Let's enter one now. Suzanne, click on the Create button. The Address Book screen is ready for us to enter our first address. Viewers, to demonstrate sending mail and using your address book, we are going to send a letter to Santa. You can join us and make your next Christmas wish list or send mail to an address you know that's more practical. Santa has his email address set up to use his own name as the computer name. There are two areas to enter information in your address book. The top box wants to know how you associate with the addressee. For example, a person's real name, mom, dad, a corporate name. We'll enter Santa Claus. With the cursor flashing in that box, type that in. Press your tab key and the cursor is now flashing in the address box. Type Santa, the at sign, that's Shift F2, SantaClaus.com. An email address cannot contain any spaces, so make sure there aren't any. With that done, click OK and OK again. 
Now click on the Compose button on the main menu screen. Here is where we address, write, and send our mail. Electronic mail is very similar to regular post office mail except that it's faster since it travels through computer and telephone line connections. We can build on our understanding of a regular letter to see how email works. In regular mail you write the address on the envelope using the person's name, street address, city, state, and zip. An email address follows a pattern just like a postal address. It includes the address information needed to route a message from your computer along the phone connections to someone else's computer. In the two box is where we put the address of our destination. You can simply type the address in this box, but since we've set up Santa's address in our address book, let's see how to retrieve it. In the lower left corner of this window is the address book icon. Click on it. A list of our addresses appears. We only have the one now, but you can imagine how it could fill up quickly. Make sure Santa is highlighted and click on the To button. Our address is automatically entered into our To box. Click OK to close the address book and click in the CC box. In the CC box you can enter another address you want your mail to be sent as a courtesy copy. You can enter your own address to send a copy of this mail to yourself. Let's do that to keep a copy of this letter. Viewers, your computer name on AOL is the ID you use to sign on. The at sign followed by AOL.com. Again, no spaces. Each provider has their own extension, so be sure if you are using another provider to use that extension. For example, Prodigy uses your username at sign Prodigy.com. So your email address has three parts. Let's put them together. First, type your account ID, the letters and numbers you use to sign on. Suzanne, do you remember ours? That's right, V Professor. Then an at sign. And finally, the name of the service location, which is AOL.com. That's it, Suzanne, our very own email address. Suzanne, we have the addresses entered, so press your tab key this time to go to the next section, Subject. This is the space where you can give a short title to your message. When email shows up in your mailbox, you'll see who it's from and the title they've given it. When you start getting lots of messages, this helps sort through the stack of mail. So when you send a message to someone else, the subject title helps them sort it out as well. You can use any kind of title you'd like. Let's call this message a new modem. Type that title into the subject box, Suzanne. And tab to the next area. We're finally ready to type the message to Santa Claus. Email messages can be as large as 24K, but we'll keep this one short and to the point. Viewers, type in your own wish list if you'd like. You never know what Cyber Santa might do. Suzanne, type Dear Santa. I've been really good so far this year. And I'd really like to get a new modem for my computer. Thanks. See you at Christmas. There's your letter to Santa, Suzanne. Professor, I didn't sign it. How will he know who it's from? You're right, Suzanne. It's a courtesy to add a sign-off. Many folks add quotes and other taglines to their email messages as well. But even if you didn't, your computer name would be automatically added to the message and displayed in your receiver's incoming mailbox along with the subject line. Go ahead and type your name at the bottom, Suzanne. This is a good place to use your real name instead of your email name. Suzanne, highlight your name by dragging your mouse cursor over it like you would do in any word processor. Notice we have a few formatting icons at the top of this box. Click the B for boldface and your name is now boldfaced. Notice you can change the color of the text, font size, boldface, underline, italicize, and change the alignment of text to left, center, or right justify. That's it, Suzanne. Your email is ready to go. All you need to do to send it is click send. But don't do that just yet. I want to show you one other feature of the email program. See the icon marked Attach? Click on it, Suzanne. Email is not only a good, fast, and inexpensive way to write letters, it can also be used to send computer files. You could use this file dialog box to select the file you want to send. Then when you send your mail, the file would go with it. 
When your mail is received, the new mail window will show you an icon that signifies that the email has an attached file. The name of the attached file, its size, and the amount of time it will take to download will be indicated. There are buttons on the bottom that give you the option of downloading now or later. I won't go into detail with attaching files in this lesson, but will show you where to go to find more information about it. But first, let's send our mail to Santa, so cancel out of this dialog box. Now all you need to do is click on the Send button. You are prompted that it has indeed been sent, so click OK. Professor, since I'm in AOL, if I send a letter to someone with a different provider, will they get it? Yes, they would, Suzanne. Since your mail does travel over the Internet, it can go to all the other online services. I want to cover a few more things about your email service before we move on. Close this window. To find out more about attaching files, click on Basic Email Help. Now click on How do I download an attached file? From here you can read about the do's and don'ts about this subject. Click the Close button. You can also read about other internet mail services here and how AOL handles them. Close this window and click on Beyond the Basics. Here you can read about how to attach files to your documents plus other subjects that may interest you. Now close this window and open your Mail drop-down menu and choose Mail You've Sent. We now get a list of mail we've sent. We can read it again, show status, or delete it. Let's do that, Suzanne, to get rid of our letter to Santa. Simply make sure it is highlighted, click the Delete button, and it's gone. Now close all the windows back to the Welcome screen. Look, we have mail. Click on that button. Remember, we sent Santa's letter to ourselves. To read incoming mail, simply click on it or highlight it and click on the Read button. There's our letter. Let's delete it also since there is no need to keep a copy of it. Select Mail and Mail You've Read This Time. Make sure it is highlighted and click Delete. Go ahead and close the mail windows to get back to our welcome screen. You'll quickly collect your own list of email addresses as you talk with online friends and exchange messages. On the screen now are some other popular email addresses. Happy mailing! By the way, if you're ever just checking places out and get a little lost, you can always return to this welcome screen by pulling down the Go To Menu item and selecting the Welcome menu, or go to the Channel screen by clicking on the third icon on the menu bar the channels icon. It's time for us to move on to the next topic, Suzanne, a visit to the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is the fastest growing and most popular segment of the Internet. It utilizes an easy to use graphical interface to display and explore any subject from growing flowers to building jet engines. It is often just called the Web for short. Click on the Internet button, Suzanne. This opens another screen with a variety of topics to choose from. This screen allows you to check out the best of or search for things on the web, news groups, Gopher, and FTPs. You can enter AOL's website by clicking here on the Welcome to the Web Graphic button. For now, click on the Internet Connection button. You can also get to this location from the channel screen. Again, we have several choices of places to go on the right side of the screen. There is a lot of information about the Internet here and a good place to come back and check out what's being said. For now, Suzanne, click on the World Wide Web Graphic button on the left of this window. Viewers, again, I must emphasize that what you see on your screen will not match what we see here. These opening screens change often, displaying topics of the current times. The subjects we will discuss should still be available somewhere on this opening screen. We are now in the World Wide Web. 
You can tell because we now have a little box on top of the screen showing the URL or Universal Resource Locator of this home page, also known simply enough as their web address. In this case, the address of AOL's World Wide Web homepage. By the way, since we are now on the web, this home page can be brought up no matter what internet provider you are using. If you can access the web, just type this address in your address box and follow along. Before exploring the web, let's take some time to look at some of the components of these web pages. The first is hyperlinks. You've already seen how clicking on buttons, icons, and colored text can take you to different locations. This connection through these different locations is called hypertext links and hypermedia links, also known as hyperlinks. AOL's Welcome to the World Wide Web screen offers many options that will take you off into different directions. Suzanne, move your mouse pointer around the screen and notice how the pointer turns into a hand as it moves over the graphics and colored words. As we've seen, clicking on these graphic symbols or colored words will take you to a new location associated with that link. For example, click on Starting Out. We now have another page with more choices. Scroll down a bit, and we have topics of how it works, finding your way around, and history. Choosing any of these subjects will take you to other pages with information on that subject or give you more choices pertaining to that subject. For example, click on History. And now we get some more information to read, another list of things to check out. And scrolling down the page, we see a list of documents including a history of the Internet by Bruce Sterling. There is some good reading here that you may want to come back to. Scroll back up the page. Clicking on any of these titles in blue will take you to other pages with related information. Again, hyperlinks allows a user to point and click on words or graphic symbols to move to a new location or file. The unique thing about the hyperlinks you find on the web is that a single click on these items can move you to a different part of this page or a completely different computer site halfway around the world. This shift won't even be noticeable to you except for a small time lag as the screen changes. Will I be charged for long distance when it moves to a website out of my area? No, Suzanne. There is no long distance charge for this move and that is the beauty of the Internet. You are only being charged for your online time through your provider. Remember, the Internet is not owned or controlled by anyone, so nobody is tracking or controlling these links that make up the Internet connections. Again, notice the symbols and text in the little box just above this screen. This box displays the web address for this home page. Each location opens with what's known as a home page. A home page is the starting point for a specific web location, and people are adding new home pages by the minute. You'll find home pages from individuals who may be looking for other people with similar interests to major corporations, governments, even countries. These home pages are accessible to anybody throughout the world who is on the Internet. These web address boxes are automatically filled in to identify the website showing on the screen. These often start with HTTP, colon, slash, slash, followed by www. This stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol on the World Wide Web followed by the name assigned to the computer. This one, aol.comstarthistory.html, is a page connected to the Starting Out home page. If you knew another web address you wanted to visit, you could type it in this box, press Enter, and you would be taken to that address. Each home page may have hyperlinks that take it further down the page you're on to other pages in that site or to other sites around the world. It translates the hypertext links into behind-the-scenes commands so you can easily surf the web. Web surfing or cruising means just following various links out of curiosity. A web surfer uses the hypertext links to move from one location to another just to see where they'll end up. With hyperlinks, web documents are continuously being connected together. Each hyperlink pointer ties one web page to another web page and another with a simple click of the mouse. The process creates an intricate crisscross of resources that might literally look like a spider web weaving together computers from all over the world. Remember, the web is changing daily. Links you may find today may be changed tomorrow, and new links will certainly be added. Believe me, the web is a very dynamic place. Again, viewers, this means that what you see on your computer screen may not be exactly the same as what is on our screens as we proceed through the lesson. One more thing we should understand before we move on and that is the tools we use to find our way around this gigantic wealth of information. 
There are two basic programs that help with this task. They are browsers and search tools. Browsers are programs that allow you to look at pages as you follow your hyperlinks through the web choosing different subjects. Search engines allow you to type in keywords for places or subjects that interest you and they will scour the web looking for locations that contain the words you've typed. That seems simple enough, but what can get complicated is there are several different browsers and search programs you can choose from with their own functions that make it better for a particular task. Some of these programs are choices you have within AOL and some you need to download into your computer from other websites. This should become clear as we move along. Suzanne, click on the welcome button. And now we are looking at AOL's Welcome to the Web homepage again. On the left, we see more choices other than the starting out page we already visited. Along the top, we see a place to enter information to start a search, and under that, an offer to start browsing. Suzanne scrolled down this page just a bit to see what Browse has to offer. Notice we have several specific choices of subjects here for a variety of topics. Since we are learning about the Internet, let's choose that. You can always come back here and check out some of the other choices later. Suzanne, put your little hand over Internet and click. We now have entered part of AOL's web crawler program. This program allows us to search and browse the Internet. Again, we have several areas of the Internet we can choose by simply clicking on the options listed. Let's check out some of the other pages of the web crawler. These icons along the top will take us there. Click on search. We now see the box where we can enter information on what we might search for and under that a list of places we can start exploring. Suzanne, see the search button just on top of this window? Click on that. Now we can see AOL's two favorite search tools. Web Crawler and Excite. Unlike the other box we saw with just the word search, this box offers two search tools to choose from when starting a search. Again, typing in keywords for your search into this box can help you find locations that contain what you're looking for. We'll try a search in a minute. Further down the page, we see some choices for searching news groups and gopher sites. We'll cover what those programs are in a later lesson. Real quickly, though, news groups are locations for you to enter and read information on a variety of subjects. And Gopher is another area of the Internet, usually text-based, that contains information on just about any subject. It was the most popular part of the Internet until the advent of the World Wide Web. Scrolling down some more, we see other search engines. As you can see, there are plenty of search engines often referred to as search tools, and the last one, Searchcom, has an extensive list of other search tools. Again, we'll do searches later, but for now, see the little box with the word back in it? This button takes you back to the previous page you had on screen. Click on it, Suzanne. Now back in the web crawler program, click on Special. Now we have more choices. Web Roulette looks fun. Scroll down the page a bit. Let's see how to use hyperlinks to surf the web. Here we have a choice of looking at the top 25 most linked to sites. Click on that, Suzanne. As you can see, this list is compiled of the top 25 most visited sites using the web crawler program. It will change often. The first one, Netscape, is a very popular browser that in order to use, you need to download to your computer. It is the number one spot, so a lot of people must like it. You may want to come back and check it out for yourself later. The second is a search tool called Yahoo. We'll use that in a minute. Well, it looks like a lot of people have visited the White House, so why don't we see what we can find? Click on Welcome to the White House. Notice AOL has two ways of showing it's working as we wait for our new location's home page. The logo at the top of the screen spins around, and on the bottom of the screen, we get a gauge showing us how far along we are in the downloading process. Another thing I should mention here is if you feel something is taking too long to download or you choose something by mistake, you can click the Stop button to cancel that request. We have just linked the home page of the White House welcome screen, Suzanne. Once the requested page is completely loaded, the home page URL address of our destination is displayed on the top line of our screen. Viewers, if the White House option was not available when you are viewing this lesson, 
Type the White House address into the URL address box. Whitehouse.gov forward slash WH forward slash welcome dot HTML. Just like an email address, this cannot have any spaces. Use the scroll bars to move us down the page. Let's continue using the browse method to find some interesting subjects. Here we have several choices you can make to find information on the subjects that interest you. Each selection tells a little bit about what that topic contains. Let's move on another step and see what White House history and tours has to offer. Now we have four more choices of topics. Let's look at a White House history. This really allows us to get pretty specific, doesn't it, Professor? Yes, it is, Suzanne. Each layer we peel back gives us more and more options that get more and more specific. Gee, Professor, this might take a long time. Look at how slow it's going. Yes, Suzanne, and that will give us a chance to mention something very important. It will sometimes take several minutes to download a home page, especially if it has a lot of graphics. And there might also be a delay in making the connection in the event that all the lines or ports are busy. Graphics are one of the neat things about the web. However, the larger the graphic file, the longer it will take to download to your machine. In some cases, you may be interested in the graphics or you may be interested only in the accompanying information. The web browsers provide you a way to view a home page with the graphic downloading capability turned off. This allows you to move much faster around the web. We'll see how to do this in a second. Well, Suzanne, I see that our screen has finally loaded, and now we have a screen displaying all the White House rooms we can enter to find out even more information. Let's choose the East Room. Now let's check out some options we have with the menu items and the row of buttons on the top of this screen. We already mentioned the stop button. When you begin a process and decide that it was a wrong choice or it's taking too long, you simply hit the stop button to abort. Jumping to the left side of these buttons, we see the back button that we've used once before. Suzanne, click on this button and you'll notice we are given our previous screen. This button is very useful. Once in a while, you will find yourself following a link that becomes a dead end. Or you might just want to back up a page or two to take a different direction. For example, to check out another room from this screen, the back button causes the browser to retrace its steps. Likewise, the forward button will take you forward. This only works if you've used the back button. Suzanne, click on the Prefs button. Remember I said earlier that we can turn the graphics off so you don't spend a lot of time waiting for screens to download. Here is where you do that. Click in the circle next to No Graphics to turn graphics off. Also, notice at the bottom of this dialog box, you can enter a home address. When you enter the web, if you would like a particular website to be your home base, so to speak, you would enter that address here. Then, when you select the Home button, you are taken to that location. Viewers, if you have a favorite place to go, enter that address. Suzanne, just to demonstrate how this works, let's enter the search home page as that's a good place to always start our journey into cyberspace. The home address defaults to AOL's home page. Click at the end of com, add a forward slash and enter search, and another forward slash. Now click on OK. Now click on the red room and notice this page loads a little faster without the graphics. We also seem to be missing the text associated with the picture. Scroll down the page and notice we do have text where we can still read all about it. Scroll up again. Now open the Prefs window again and select Compressed Graphics to turn graphics back on. Click OK and now click the Reload button. Notice the same page loads, but we now see the pictures. Having graphics off is a good way to surf the web with less online time. And when you arrive at a site you want to see, turn graphics on and reload the screen. There is one problem when exploring locations with graphics turned off. Many websites also contain graphic buttons for links to other locations. If you can't see them, you might be missing some obvious choices you don't see with just text. Now click on the Home button. Since we entered search as our home in the prefs window, we are now taken to that page. Suzanne, see the down arrow next to the address box? Click on that. 
We now see a list of all the websites we have visited so far. Clicking on any of these will take you back to that address. Click on the White House History Index address, and we are back to that site. Professor, this page loaded a lot faster this time. That is because these pages, once loaded, store themselves in your AOL cache folder. The amount of pages that can be stored depends on how much hard drive space is delegated for your cache folder. This can be a problem if you have limited hard drive space or your computer seems to run slower while on the Internet. Suzanne, click on the Preps button, and when that window appears, click on the Advanced button. A dialog box appears showing how much hard drive space is delegated to your cache folder. Again, this folder stores web pages for quick access. As it's filled up, the earliest stored page is automatically deleted as new pages are opened and stored. You can add or reduce the space delegated by clicking on the up and down arrows next to the number. You really don't need to worry about it unless you have limited hard drive space. However, setting this lower may help your computer run faster. It may also help your computer run faster to purge the cache folder every now and then to delete all the pages that are stored there. Suzanne, let's limit our hard drive space a little and set the cache to 4 megs. Go ahead and purge the cache. And select OK. And OK again. Now pull down the Go To menu item and choose Favorite Places. This box allows you to store the web page as an object file so you can quickly go to this location or any location you enter here. Click on Add Favorite Place. This box allows you to enter a title and address to your favorite place, but you must know what that address is. Suzanne, close this window and click on Add Folder. You can add your own folder here. This is good if you have several people using your computer, and each person could have their own folder of favorite places. Or you could have folders for different categories of subjects. Click on the Close button, Suzanne, to close the folder window and then close the Favorite Places window. Now click and hold on the window option on the menu bar and drag down to select Add to Favorite Places and Release. This is an easy way to add a location to your favorite place. Remember to only do this when you are actually in the location you want to keep for quick access. Click on Favorite Places again. Now we see a White House history listed in our folder. These locations are also easy to delete. You just highlight it and click the Delete button. This is really a handy tool. When you find a page you know you want to revisit, just add it to your favorite places. When you want to go to that page in the future, just open this box, double-click on your choice, and you're there. Now close this window. Back to the options on our web page, you see we have a search button. Anytime you want, you can enter a search mode by clicking this button. The only thing left here is help. You can usually find help on anything and in just about any place you visit. In AOL or on the Internet, anytime you see a file marked Help or Frequently Asked Questions, it may be a good thing to look at. Many people have the same problems using the Internet, so you can be pretty sure that someone has already asked the question you are thinking of. One more icon I'd like to point out is the printer. Just click this icon while in the site you'd like to print, and you'll have a hard copy of that page. So far, we've just used hypertext links to surf the web. Now let's see how to use search tools. We could press the back button until we go back to the search page, but since we put it as our home page, just click on the home button, Suzanne. Now back on the search page, scroll down to the bottom where we saw all the other search engines. Notice some of these search tools are better than others for searching for specific file types, databases, or groups of information. AOL's Web Crawler and Excite will probably find most of what you are looking for. If not, try some other ones to see if they can find it. Suzanne, click on Search.com. This takes us to an excellent site for finding information on just about any subject. It contains links to free software, computer news, stock quotes, and just about every search tool there is plus much more. On the top, AltaVista is the default search engine. Suzanne, scroll down the page a little, and we see two boxes marked Search For and Choose. 
Click the down arrow next to Choose. And we see even more search tool programs. Yahoo was the default, and as we saw, it was the second most visited site. So let's keep that as our search tool, Suzanne. Select Yahoo. In an earlier internet lesson, we searched for information about NASA's mission to send a probe into Jupiter's atmosphere. Let's see what information we can find on this now. Suzanne, click in the query box and enter NASA. And click search. Whoa! It seems we have 439 sites found with that search criteria. We could scroll down through all of them until we find the one we want, but let's see if we can get better results by being more specific. Click the back button once. Search tools look for matches to words like the finder does in your Windows program. The more description you can enter, the better your chances of finding that information. Suzanne, we know the name of the mission was Galileo, so enter a space after NASA and type Galileo and press the search button again. That's better. We are now told two sites were found meeting our criteria. Remember, if you don't get good results in your searches, go back and enter more information or try another search tool. Now we are back to a browse method. Suzanne, scroll down the page to see what we have. Now click on Galileo Project Information. Now we have a picture of the probe entering Jupiter. We could print it out if we wished. Scrolling down the page, we can see a lot of information to read about this mission. Physical information, mission overview, science objectives, science first of the mission, plus much more. We already know how to explore the menu options on this page. And you may want to come back later, but for now, let's use our search tools to find information that I promised on other service providers. Suzanne, go back to our CNET screen. Now in the query box, type Internet Service Providers. A space, CopyServe, a space, Prodigy. Let's see what we can find out about these services. Click Search. We have one match to our query. Scroll down this page a bit. Let's choose Online Connection. Well, it seems this home page has changed its address. Click on it, Suzanne. Well, it seems the information we need is all here, and I might add, put together by a 16-year-old boy named Jay. Suzanne, click on Online Services. Now we have icons of the larger service providers. Clicking on any of their icons will take you to pages that explain everything about their service. You could actually download their software and sign on right on the spot. Click on the pricing plans. Viewers, as we were shooting this video, MSN and AOL announced a new pricing plan of $19.95 a month for unlimited service. Check out this World Wide Web page for popular service providers' latest pricing information. For those of you who are not online and want additional information, here are the 800 numbers for these services. Suzanne, click the back button. Click the back button again and choose National ISPs. Now we get a list of more providers. You can look at their features to see what they have to offer and price comparisons with these services. Click on the back button three times to get back to our original search results page. This time, select Business and Economy Companies. Scrolling down this page, we see quite a lot of providers. These are usually just access providers that don't carry a lot of bells and whistles with the program. 
but do offer one-time monthly charges for Internet access. Some are set up for business use, while others offer you business opportunities if you help sell their services. You could spend a lot of time checking them out, but if Internet access is all you want, this is the place to look. Well, before I let you go, I suppose we ought to figure out how to log off of America Online. That should be easy, Professor. Since this is a Windows-based program, can I pull down the File menu and see if there's an Exit command? Sounds reasonable to me, Suzanne. Give it a try. The exit command opens a dialog box asking us if we are sure we want to sign off. We are, so click sign off. We are offline but not out of the program yet, so do file and exit again to close the program. And we are returned to our window screen. That was kind of a whirlwind tour, Suzanne. What do you think? Well, Professor, I have a much better understanding of what the Internet is all about, and now I'm anxious to go back and explore some of those other topics we saw on the web and to send some email to my friends telling them how much I learned. And okay, okay, Suzanne. As soon as we get done here, you can sign back on. And thanks for driving us around on our tour. I hope to see you and all our other viewers out on the information highway in the near future now that you realize how simple it is to get on and off the freeway. As for now, thanks for joining me, the Video Professor.